Okay. Hi, everyone. It looks like we have about 22 people in attendance right now. If you can hear me and see me, could you let me know? There's a chat, should be just off to the right hand side of your screen. And just let me know if you can hear me and see me. That would be great. Perfect. Okay, looks like everyone can see me. Wonderful. Good. So am I clear? Everything sounds good. Can we see the um, the presenter? It, it should be not in presenter view right now, but just my slideshow, the slide deck. Can you also see that on the bottom? Great. Okay, perfect. Well, we're two minutes after two now, so we'll get started. I think that people can join in uh, as they come. We're up to 24 now, so I assume we'll have some more trickling in, uh, but we'll get started with the content. So as you know, we're here now to talk about um, just some basic healthy eating, um, and we'll be applying sort of some of the, the things that we talk about, of course, uh, to COVID and social isolation and, and how we can try to eat healthy and stay well during this a uh, crazy time. So I hope everyone is doing well from home and working from home and all of that. It's really great that we're able to continue doing these health promotion sessions online. This is um, the first week that we're doing it. And I believe this is only the second one that's happened so far. So it's still new. Um, so hopefully everything goes smoothly. Let me know in the chat if anything uh, is, is going wrong. But uh, the only thing is I won't be able to see the chat while I'm presenting because I have to put it in presenter view and then that's all I'll be able to see on my screen. So I will maybe try to check back on the chat periodically just to make sure that there's nothing uh, going on. And if you can just let me know as you go, that would be great. All right, so the other thing is because of that, uh, in terms of questions, if you do have them, uh, maybe just write them down uh, yourself rather than putting them in, in the chat because I won't be able to see them as we go. So unfortunately, we will have to save questions for the end. We'll have some time to go through them. Um, so when we go back to questions, you'll be able to type them into the chat and, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them for you that way. So in order for you to see better my presentation, I'm going to turn off my video so you won't see my face during the presentation. You'll just see um, the slides, that way you can read them really clear. They'll be bigger that way. Um, and then I'll turn my, my video back on at the end um, during the question period. So we'll give this a try. I'll turn off my video. In presenter mode for the presentation. So hopefully everyone can see that um, and we'll get started. So uh, my name is Madison Walsh. I am a health promotion specialist with PSP uh, at CFB Halifax here in Nova Scotia. Um, I have a master's of public health and I'm a registered dietitian. So of course this topic is very relevant to me and what I do. Um, so I love talking about healthy eating and nutrition um, and uh, hopefully you guys learn something and uh, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions at the end. Before we get started in the content, this is just a slide we've been asked to, uh, to share for all of our presentations that we're doing online. So the presentation and information that you're about to see uh, is the intellectual property of the Department of National Defense. And of course, we're not allowed to reproduct or uh, retransmit these slides in the presentation. That's strictly forbidden. So make sure you're not recording or taking photos of these slides. Um, that would be great. Uh, some topics in, that are discussed in this webinar also may be of sensitive nature. There's really not much in nutrition um, that's much of a concern. But just as a disclaimer, if you have a child on your lap or what have you, just be aware that, of course, this presentation is intended for adults. Um, but of course, it's nutrition. So it's it's a very PG presentation. So I personally wouldn't worry about it for this one. But just to be aware of that. Um, also, please understand that people's stories are theirs to tell. And if anyone shares anything in this presentation in on the chat or in camera, um, there's a certain element of privacy that's expected from that. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available for viewing later on on the CAF Connection website. Um, so anyone who wasn't able to join us today and see it live should be able to watch it um, later. Okay, so in terms of healthy eating, um, these are actually a few points that we, we bring up every time that we talk about healthy eating. Um, so why it's important, it includes things like disease prevention, 
it reduces illness and it helps uh, individuals recover from illnesses and injuries a lot quicker. So I thought it was a really great idea to include this slide in this presentation today uh, because with you know the coronavirus going on, um, all of these things are particularly important. So even on a normal day, uh, eating well and having good nutrition does help to prevent the risk of diseases. Um, it does help to uh, increase our immune system and helps, uh, helps us to recover more quickly. I will say though, that of course we know that there's no one particular food or super food as they're often called that will particularly boost your immune system or protect you from the coronavirus. But eating a healthy, balanced diet can help to reduce illness and increase immune function. So when we're thinking about healthy eating, it's a balanced approach. It's not about eating one food to cure yourself of something, but it's about making sure that you're getting all of the vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients that you need in order to stay healthy and um, live well. So we'll talk a little bit about how we achieve a balanced diet and what that means um, in terms of what we're eating. So you'll see here a photo of Canada's new food guide. It just came out in 2019. Hopefully you've seen it before, but if you haven't, this is a great opportunity to learn. Um, so we've moved away from the old food guide where we had uh, four categories of food groups, and now we're using more of a plate model. So rather than talking about specific portions and the number of portions of each food group that you should have, which was the main focus of the old food, food guide, we're now talking more about proportions. So when I say proportions, we're looking at how much of your plate is composed of each type of food. So as you can see on the photo, we have about half of our plate that's covered in fruits and vegetables, a quarter of protein foods, and a quarter of whole grains. So that's the general advice in terms of the proportions of the different types of foods that you're eating um, in order to achieve a balanced diet. So the goal of this new food guide was to make eating more real and actionable in everyday life because um, no one really eats and keeps track of the exact number of portions of this food or that food that they're, that they're consuming, but rather they fill their plate with food and, and then they eat it. So this is a much more... Um, approachable way for people to think about how much food in each group they're eating. So um, healthy eating is also not just about more, uh, it's not just about food, it's about more than food. So it includes things like being mindful of your eating habits, including taking time to eat and listening to when your body is telling you that you're hungry and when it's saying that you're full. Cooking more often at home, so planning your meals, involving any of your family members or those that you live with in, in the planning and preparing of meals. Enjoying your food. Um, so when we talk about enjoying our food, that could be culturally, different traditions that people may have, um, and really being mindful about what you're eating. And then lastly, eating meals with others. So the social aspect of eating has been recognized to be very important in our overall health. So I will point out that all of these can be quite easily applied even during social isolation um, and this, this worldwide pandemic that's going on. And they're also very important and very relevant, um, especially in the cases of today where we're seeing less people, perhaps less involved. But it's a great opportunity to take time and cook more often, find new recipes to try, um, enjoy your food, take more time to eat rather than you know, having only half an hour perhaps to eat your lunch in between meetings, now you have much more time to prepare and enjoy that food. And although we might not be able to eat meals with our friends like we once were at this time, um, maybe use this as an opportunity to uh, use electronics and perhaps use FaceTime or Skype to share a meal together that way. It's a great way to do it. I actually, uh, just last week, we had a virtual dinner with my in-laws and my own family. Um, and we uh, ate together. We we decided on a meal. We both cooked um, the same meal and and ate it together through FaceTime, which was pretty cool. So I'd recommend giving that a try and uh, enjoying that meal together. So um, when we think about the nutrients that are comprising uh, a balanced diet, um, of course, food is still the fundamental 
um, part of a balanced diet and food is composed of a variety of different nutrients. So we have six types of nutrients that are important to discuss. The first three that you see, carbohydrates, protein, and fat are the macronutrients. And then we have two micronutrients, which are vitamins and minerals, um, which each have many different uh, items in those categories, which we'll discuss. And lastly, water, which actually does count as its own nutrient. It's often the forgotten nutrient, but of course, as we know, it's very important and we'll discuss uh, more about its importance here in a bit. So we'll dive in first to macronutrients, so carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and we'll start off with carbohydrates. So carbohydrates provide your body with energy and they help to regulate your blood, gluco your blood glucose, so your blood sugars. And there's two forms of carbohydrates. We have simple and we have complex. Uh, carbohydrates should also provide approximately 45 to 65% of the total calories that you're consuming in a day. Um, so keep in mind though, that, that it's difficult to calculate those percentages. And that's why instead we're, we're focusing more on the proportion of our plate. Like we, like we looked at, uh, at an earlier slide where we had a quarter of our plate filled with whole grains and carbohydrates. You'll also, of course, get some of your carbo carbohydrates from the fruit and vegetable section, which is half your plate. So don't forget about that. So in the category of carbohydrates, we have all kinds of things. Most people, they first think about grain products. But like I said, we also have fruit and vegetables. We have milk and alternatives, legumes, lots of snack foods, including baked goods, cookies, ice cream, that sort of thing. All of those sugary foods would also be sources of carbohydrates. And we're gonna talk now about the two uh, different types of carbohydrates. So we have simple and complex, like I said. So simple carbohydrates are comprised of single monosaccharide units, whereas complex are, of course, just a more complex chemical structure. So due to the complexity of that structure, complex carbohydrates take a little more time to digest compared to simple carbohydrates. When we're thinking about simple, those ones are usually um, the sweet, uh, foods because we're really talking about sugar when we're thinking about simple carbohydrates. So your fruits would be included there. Some of your vegetables, the sweeter vegetables would, would have simple carbohydrates like carrots or sweet potato. Um, and these ones have a much quicker effect on your blood glucose levels. They raise quite a bit quicker um, as a result of the lack of fiber. So in complex carbohydrates, typically they come with more fiber. They take more time to digest, which helps to prevent that quick raise in our blood sugar. And it's a bit of a more slow, gradual uh, raise in blood sugar levels. So looking a little bit closer at simple carbohydrates, um, these are some of the foods that would uh, be included in this category. We have milk and milk products, which are rich in calcium, vitamin D and protein, as well as carbohydrates. Then we have fruit and some vegetables, the sweeter ones. Um, that are obviously rich in micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, and, and contain some fiber as well. And then, of course, anything that's super, super sugary. So your candy, your pop, table sugar that you use in baking. And these are sometimes referred to as empty calories because they don't typically come with much else other than that sugar or that simple carbohydrate. So they're not always going to provide you with a whole lot of other nutrients that your body needs. But we'll talk about um, where these foods can fit into a balanced diet uh, a little later on, because of course we still want to be able to enjoy these types of foods. When we look at complex carbohydrates, this is where your whole grains really come in. So these whole grains, like the loaves of bread here in the photo, are really high in nutrients and high in fiber and actually help to reduce the risk of a lot of different chronic diseases, including heart disease. So these are really, really important to be including in a healthy diet. As we talked about in the food guide, these whole grains or um, uh, uh, complex carbohydrates should usually comprise about half, uh, sorry, a quarter of your plate. So they also, like I said, can uh, consist of a lot of fiber, which helps with your digestive health. It improves your cholesterol and blood sugar levels and plays a role in disease prevention. And then we have uh, vegetables, which typically are slightly more complex carbohydrates than are your fruits. And some of these contain uh, carbohydrates, not all of them, depending on the vegetable. Uh, and these are also rich in vitamins and minerals. 
So when we talk about grains, the key message here is really to choose whole grains over white products whenever possible. So you see the white rolls there at the top, perhaps you try a, a piece of whole grain bread instead um, as, your, as your option to go with your meal. Um, and the reason behind this is um, really, there, there's many, we're gonna talk about them here in a second, but there's a, a whole lot of benefits of, of eating uh, whole grain over white. So this can include whole grain breads, oats, quinoa, whole grain pasta, wild rice, things like that. And, and these are really a great source of nutrients and fiber, whereas the white uh, counterpart products are, are not as great sources of those uh, nutrients. So here's a diagram just to show you um, the process and, and why whole grain versus white are, are different. So here you see um, kind of the elements of a grain. So outside, on the outside of a natural grain is the bran. So this is a rich, a fiber rich outer layer that protects the seed and it contains all of your B vitamins and trace minerals. So it's really got all those micronutrients um, that your body needs and that's a huge health benefit in itself. Then inside the bran, you find the endosperm, which is the middle layer that contains carbohydrates and some proteins. And inside that, we have the germ which is a very small but nutrient-rich core of the grain that contains antioxidants and certain vitamins and healthy fats as well. So as you can see on the right-hand side, the white grain is missing both the bran and the germ. So they remove those in the processing to make your white bread a little more fluffy and soft and less chewy like whole wheat bread is. Uh, but unfortunately in that process, we're removing a lot of fiber and nutrients that are really quite good to have. Um, and so that's why we want to try to include whole grains more often than we're including white grains. That's not to say that white grains are unhealthy and we should never have them. It's just simply that whole grains have more nutrient benefits than white. We'll look a little bit more closely at fiber now. So um, fiber actually does have some uh, role in weight loss if that's something that perhaps you're interested in, not that everyone necessarily needs to be, but some people uh, do set that as a goal for themselves. So in that case, fiber actually does help to keep you feeling full for longer. They're more filling and they take longer to digest. So because of that, um, you, you will find that you're less hungry and perhaps you'll eat less food total if you're eating high fiber foods. So by choosing whole grains, uh, vegetables and fruit, legumes and, and nuts and seeds, these are great sources of fiber and can help you to feel full and feel great throughout the day. And that can sometimes help with your weight loss goal if that's something that you're interested in. So just to recap for carbohydrates and why they're important, uh, they're a rich source of nutrients and fiber. They lower the risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and some cancers. They help to maintain a healthy weight, like we just talked about, and they can support a healthy digestion and uh, GI tract. We'll just touch now on fruits and vegetables. So I have here an image of uh, canned, fresh, and frozen uh, fruit uh, peas. So these are the most common ways that fruits and vegetables are purchased, either canned, fresh, or frozen. Uh, usually here I would take a poll and ask who thinks which one is the most healthy, but since I can't see your responses, uh, we won't do that today. But just uh, kind of have an answer in your mind and, and we'll see if you're right. So if you were to guess uh, which of the three is the healthiest way to consume fruits or vegetables, um, what would it be? And the answer is actually that all of them are equally nutritious. Um, oftentimes I find that people go for saying that fresh is the healthiest, but all of them are equally nutritious. And that's because um, canning or freezing helps, it, it's a process that helps to preserve the nutrients and just makes it last longer. So the only caveat for that answer is for canned, you would need to make sure that there's no added ingredients like extra salt in your vegetables or extra sugar in your fruits. And if there isn't, if it's nothing else added other than the vegetable or fruit itself, then those products would certainly be equally nutritious as fresh or frozen. 
However, if they have extra salt or extra sugar, then of course that would be um, sort of in a different ball game because those are often um, salt and sugar we don't want to have too much of. Um, so as long as you're making sure there's no added ingredients like those, then all three options are really great. And the reason that I have this slide up for you today is of course in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, people are probably finding that they're going to the grocery store less often um, and trying to stock up a little bit, if at least for you know a week or two at a time. Um, and so of course, fresh produce doesn't always last that long. So instead, using canned or frozen uh, products can be a really great way to still make sure that you can fill half of your plate with fruit or vegetables each day, um, even once all of your fresh produce has uh, has been consumed if you're not able to go back to the grocery store. So just something to keep in mind. I, I hope that it's a bit reassuring to know that you're still getting just as many nutrients as long as you're uh, eating any of these three options and making sure there's no added ingredients in your canned products. So next we'll move on to protein. So protein comes in both plant and animal sources and it should provide approximately 10 to 35 percent of your total calories. Protein can be used for energy but more importantly it's used for maintaining healthy tissues and rebuilding those tissues as well as in hormone and enzyme production and maintenance. So when we think about animal versus plant proteins, um, Canada's Food Guide does encourage that we eat more plant pr proteins than animal proteins. And the reason behind that is that plant proteins provide more fiber and less saturated fat than animal proteins, which is really beneficial for your heart health. We're going to be talking about fat in the next section once we finish protein. Um, so I'll explain why we want to limit saturated fat. But for now, it's just good to know that the, the main reason that we want more uh, plant proteins is because of the higher fiber content and the lower saturated fat content. Of course, that's not to say that we can't be eating meat. Um, I certainly do, uh, unless you're a vegan or vegetarian for whatever reason, um, then absolutely uh, meats, uh, animal proteins can be included in a healthy diet and, and certainly should be if that's something that you choose to consume. Um, but it's just good to keep in mind that perhaps more often than not, we should be looking for uh, including plant proteins in our diet as our primary source. So here we have a list of sort of the healthiest sources of protein, and this does include both plant and animal proteins in this list. So nuts and seeds are a great way to get protein. That includes nut butters like almond butter or peanut butter. We have legumes, so you know, your chickpeas or your beans. Soy products like tofu is a great source of protein. Lean meats like chicken and fish. Dairy products, milk and cheese, that sort of thing. And eggs are also a great source of protein. So these are probably the top healthiest choices that you could make if you're looking um, for your protein sources to have in your diet. So when we talk about proteins, it's important to know um, the basic chemistry behind them. I won't go into the complicated uh, chemistry, but proteins are essentially made up of amino acid compounds. And these compounds um, compose of a protein and then are broken down in your body um, to help with the functions of protein that I mentioned, like building and repairing new tissues. So some amino acids we make in our body, but others we have to get from food because we don't make them in our body. So they're, they're called essential amino acids. So it's important to consume protein rich foods every day to get these essential amino acids because your body is actually not capable of storing um, this macronutrient or, or protein. Um, so we need to make sure we're consuming it every day so that we have enough to allow the protein to, to perform those functions that we talked about. So a complete protein is when a protein provides all of the essential amino acids. So all of the amino acids that our body is not capable of creating. So animal products are all naturally complete proteins. They all can, uh, are, are composed of essential amino acids, all of them. Animal, uh, sorry, plant proteins, not all of them are complete proteins. Some of them are, for example, uh, quinoa, tofu, tempa, things like that um, will have amino, all of the essential amino acids. 
but other plant products do not have all of the amino acids, but you can still create a complete protein by combining multiple types of plant proteins together. So some good combinations to make sure that you're getting a complete protein with your meal would be to combine grains and legumes, uh, legumes and nuts or seeds, and grains and dairy. So those are some great combinations to make sure that you're getting all of the essential amino acids with your meal. To recap with protein and why it's important, like we said, growth and repair of your body cells and tissues, building and repairing of muscles, organs, nails, tissues, and skin. It's important in the formation of hormones, antibodies, and enzymes. And it also helps you to feel full. So similar to fiber, protein takes a little longer to digest um, and therefore stays in, in your um, GI tract for longer and helps you to feel full so that you perhaps don't eat as much in the future. You don't find yourself getting hungry really quickly after you've had a meal that consisted of protein. So that's great. And now we'll move on to fats. So fats are easily divided into three categories, saturated, unsaturated, and trans. We'll talk about all three here in a moment. The recommendation is that we consume three to six teaspoons of healthy fat per day, and fat overall should provide 20 to 35% of your total calories in the day. So fats have more than twice the energy value compared to carbohydrates and protein, so they are really uh, energy-dense source. But in spite of this high energy content, they really still are important. So I think fat often gets a bad rap and people think that they need to avoid it at all costs. But there are some fats that are actually really, really healthy and really important to be included in, in your balanced diet. So we'll talk about that here. So the three types of fat, as I mentioned, are unsaturated, saturated, and trans. So unsaturated is the healthiest type of fat. This fat increases our good cholesterol or the HDL cholesterol, and actually sometimes in certain cases will decrease the bad cholesterol. So that's exactly what we want. We want um, better, better levels of good cholesterol and lower levels of bad cholesterol. So this type of fat is really important for making sure that that is achieved, and that will help to reduce our risk of uh, heart attack and stroke, which is awesome. These types of fats are liquid at room temperature. So you would see these in your oils, like your olive oil perhaps that you use for cooking, um, avocado, uh, many people maybe use avocado oil or just eat avocados in their guacamole, uh, whatever it may be. And this is a great source, to, source of unsaturated fat. Your fish is also an excellent source. Those ones would be the, fish is the one that would provide your omega-3s. And also some nuts and seeds are great sources of unsaturated fat, and some even have those omega-3s as well, which are a really great type of fat for your heart health. So it's important to include um, a lot, lots of healthy oils, fish, and uh, nuts and seeds in a balanced diet to make sure that you're getting unsaturated fat. So moving on to saturated, these types of fats actually increase the bad type of cholesterol, your LDL cholesterol, which is something that we don't particularly want to happen. So these ones we're recommending that we eat in moderation. So what are saturated fats? Well, for the most part, um, they come in animal products. So they're solid at room temperature. So exa for example, when you buy a steak uh, and you see that white strip along the edge of the steak, that would be the fat, and that's a saturated type of fat. Saturated fat is also found in dairy products like milk and yogurt. So when you see the percent milk fat number on your yogurt, that's what that's referring to. And another example of saturated fat is, uh, is coconut oil. Even though that one is called an oil, you notice that if you keep it in your pantry at room temperature, it is actually a solid rather than a liquid, and it only melts um, at a higher temperature. So it is a saturated fat in this category. So these ones we want to eat in moderation, meaning that we should try for unsaturated fats more often, but these foods that consist of saturated fats are still okay to include in, in slightly smaller amounts. And lastly, we have trans fats. So trans fats are the really uh, nasty ones. So these ones will increase your LDL cholesterol and decrease your HDL. 
So they're doing the exact opposite of what the healthy unsaturated fats are trying to do. They're uh, worsening um, our levels of good cholesterol and increasing our levels of bad cholesterol. Typically, trans fats uh, are man-made, which means that we've developed a way to create these fats. We've turned um, a, a certain type of fat into a trans fat. Sometimes trans fats um, are naturally occurring. For example, in uh, some, some types of dairy or meat, they can occur. But in those cases, it's in very, very small amounts, and we're not too concerned about that. So what we're more concerned about is the trans fats that are in man-made products. So for example, uh, margarine used to be uh, created from trans fats. So you used to be able to see the word partially hydrogenated oil, and that is your key to know that there's uh, a trans fat in that margarine. But now we see non-hydrogenated on the tubs of our margarine, and that's because trans fats have now become banned in Canada. So as of, I believe it was September 2018, uh, we are now not allowed to add trans fats to our manufactured foods, which is a really great move for Canada uh, because these fats are really not necessary in our diet. We can get by just fine with saturated and unsaturated, and there's no need for us to be making trans fats now that we, particularly now that we know how bad they can be uh, for our health. So you really don't need to worry about avoiding trans fats so much anymore because for the most part, uh, you won't see them in, in any of your products. They used to be everywhere. They would be in your, your bakery foods like muffins and croissants and things like that. But now uh, they would probably just use saturated fats like butter and things like that instead uh, because we're not allowed to use trans fats, which is great. Um, so this here is just a little comparison of some of the different types of dietary fats that we consume. And it shows you how much of each fat is um, trans saturated or polyunsaturated. Um, so you can see most of them have very little trans fat. You'll see that the hard margarine has quite a bit. This is probably an old graphic. Um, if, you, if you got the data from a, a margarine these days, it would probably have very little if if not none uh, of the trans fat because we're not allowed to use it anymore um, same thing with shortening but we'll turn to the saturated versus unsaturated um, and there's two types of unsaturated that you can see there the polyunsaturated and monounsaturated those are both two great types of unsaturated fats so what we want is an oil that has more of the two types of unsaturated, so the yellow and green bars, and less of the saturated, so the red bars. So as you can see, um, olive oil, for example, is one that people use often, and that has a pretty good profile. Um, it has 75% of um, monounsaturated fat, and that's a really great fat for us to be eating, and only 14% of saturated fat. Whereas if you look down lower, coconut oil, for example, at the very bottom is really high in saturated fat and quite low in the unsaturated fats. So this is just a really handy tool when you're choosing what oils to use in cooking. You should be choosing ones that have higher percentages of unsaturated fats. And to recap on fats, why are fats important? They also help to make you feel satisfied and full after the meal, similar to protein and fiber. And they make your meal uh, taste really good, of course, so that's a big plus. Uh, they're a source of essential fatty acids, which we need in our diet. They are um, helpful for fat-soluble vitamins, which we will talk about in a moment. Um, so certain vitamins require fat for us to be able to absorb them. Uh, which is a great role for these fats. And they do help to provide um, energy from food as well. All right, so that concludes our macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And now we'll move on to the micronutrients. So when we talk about micronutrients, there's two categories. One is vitamins and one is minerals. And these types of micronutrients have to come to you from your food because from the most, for the most part, your body cannot produce micronutrients, uh, with the exception of vitamin D, because of course, as we know, vitamin D comes from the sun, uh, and our body produces it 
through a process with um, with the sun. Other than that, we have to eat all of our micronutrients through our food or through supplements if food uh, sources are not available. So the content of micronutrients in different types of food is different um, based on the food and a lot of other factors. So the best way to ensure that you're getting all of the micronutrients that you need is to eat a variety of different types of foods, particularly fruits and vegetables, rather than eating uh, the same types of foods every day. By eating a variety, you help to make sure that you're getting enough of all of the essential uh, vitamins and minerals. So first we'll talk about vitamins. So vitamins are necessary for things like energy production, immune function, and blood clotting, as well as numerous other functions. And like I said, there's two categories of these ones, which are water soluble and fat soluble. So we'll take a look at the difference. Um, water soluble vitamins include vitamin C and vitamin B. There's lots of different types of vitamin B. Uh, you maybe have heard of things like vitamin B6 and B12. Those would all fall under that category. And then on the right, we have fat soluble vitamins, which includes vitamins A, D, E, and K. So as I mentioned in the fat section, a, D, E, and K, they require fat for our bodies to be able to absorb them. So if you're eating foods with those vitamins in them, then it's best to eat those foods along with a, uh, a fat source to make sure that they um, are absorbed to their fullest extent. It's also important to note that water-soluble vitamins are uh, more easily eliminated from the body because uh, when you go to the bathroom, uh, they're eliminated through your urine. However, fat-soluble vitamins, they are stored in our fat and are not as easily eliminated from the body. So there can be more of a concern of a vitamin overdose with those that are fat-soluble than with those that are water-soluble. So that's just something to keep in mind. However, if you're getting your vitamin sources from food, it's highly, highly unlikely that anyone would overdose on any of those vitamins. The concern comes when people are taking super doses of supplements in those vitamins. That would be how someone could potentially overdose and have too much and have negative effects from those vitamins. But for the average person, it's really not much of a concern. We'll look at minerals now. So minerals play an important role in bone, uh, in growth, bone health, fluid balance, as well as lots of other things. Um, and I'll just touch on a few of the important ones uh, instead of going through all of them, because there is quite a few. Um, we have iron, which is really important, particularly in females as a result of the menstrual cycle. Um, so that one sometimes is recommended that we take a supplement if, if we're female and if we do have low levels. Uh, it's also important to note for iron that the most absorbable sources come from animal proteins. Um, so that would be your heme iron. It's less absorbable when, when someone is following a vegetarian or vegan diet. So that's something to pay attention to if you are following that diet, making sure that you're getting in, enough iron. Calcium is another one, of course, that we we hear about all the time uh, because that's important for our bone strength. So making sure that we're getting enough of that. Although if you consume dairy products uh, in any amount, then you're likely fine in that department. You'll get lots of calcium from those, as well as many other sources um, of foods will provide calcium. So that's uh, unlikely that you need a supplement in that one. And potassium is another really important one. It provides um, fluid balance, so it does play a role in blood pressure. But again, we get plenty of this in our fruits and vegetables that we consume uh, regularly, so there's not, uh, not too much to, to worry about with that one, just sort of uh, an interesting fact. Okay, so that's it for micronutrients. If you do have any specific questions about the micronutrients, we can maybe talk about uh, some in a, a bit more detail if you are wondering about them, but there's just so many that we won't spend too much time on them. Um, so we'll move on to fluids from here. So water, as I mentioned, is uh, one of the nutrients in uh, on that first slide that, that I showed. Um, and so it's very important that we're consuming enough water. So in Canada's food guide, uh, it does recommend that we make water our drink of choice. So our first choice when we're looking for something to drink should always be water. Um, and then there's lots of other uh, possibilities that we can consume that will still count towards our fluid intake, but maybe perhaps just aren't the absolute healthiest way to consume fluid. 
So milk is a really common one that we get lots of questions about because it the the dairy products section of the Canada's Food Guide was technically removed in the new food guide. It used to be a focus and now it's less so. Um, so we've we've moved dairy to be included in the protein category rather than being a category on its own because it is a really great source of, of protein. However, we recognize that not everyone consumes dairy. In fact, a lot of people are lactose intolerant and dairy is not necessarily uh, required to be in a human's diet. That's not to say that it's not a healthy choice. Absolutely, uh, it really can be. If that's something that you choose to consume, then it's a great choice. It does provide lots of vitamins and minerals, but it's possible to get those same vitamins and minerals elsewhere. So because of that, we're recognizing that it doesn't need to be a food group on its own. Juice is another one that we get lots of questions about because it also used to be considered a serving of fruit or vegetable if it's a vegetable juice, um, but not anymore. And the reason behind that is fruit comes with a great deal of, um, of sugar. And unfortunately, in the processing, the fiber is removed when we, when we create juice. So rather than eating a full orange and getting all of the... Um, uh, fiber that comes with that full fruit, we're now only getting the juice and removing the fiber. So that's going to result in a spike in our uh, blood sugar um, rather than what would happen when the fiber helps to lower our blood sugar when we eat a whole orange instead of the juice. So it's always recommended to eat fruit whole rather than drink juice whenever possible. Um, on the top right, I have a cup of coffee there. So coffee actually does count towards your fluid intake. Um, it is a bit of a diuretic, but it's not enough of one that it um, does not count towards your fluid intake because if you drink a cup of coffee, you still do gain more fluid than you lose um, through urination. But the recommendation is that we have no more than 400 milligrams of caffeine per day. Um, so that equates to about three eight ounce cups of coffee. So that would be the recommendation in terms of caffeine. If you're drinking decaf coffee, then there's really nothing to worry about there um, because you wouldn't be getting any caffeine. And lastly, I have an image there of different types of pop or soda. Uh, these are very high in sugar and unfortunately have no nutrient value. So as opposed to juice, at least juice still comes with the vitamins and minerals that, the, that are in the fruit. But with pop, it's really just sugar and water. So high, high sugar and no other nutrient value. So therefore, they're not really recommended. Um, but of course, they can still be included as a treat every now and then. Um, so just to recap for fluids, um, lots of different things can contribute to your fluid intake, including water, milk, juice, soup. So even some types of soups or other foods that have high water content, like watermelon, for example, can count towards your fluid intake as well as tea and coffee. But it's the best idea to satisfy your thirst with water as a first, um, a first choice and then the others sort of as, uh, as backup. And the total recommendation is that we drink 2.2 liters of fluid a day. That's on average. We also want to limit our intake of high sugar drinks. So any uh, soft drinks, sports drinks, fruit drinks, punches, hot chocolate, uh, as well as alcohol, which can be high in sugar sometimes for your coolers and things like that. Um, so those, sh those should be limited as much as possible. So why is fluid important? It's really important for pretty much every reason. Uh, anything in the body that happens requires fluid for it to happen. Um, it maintains the function of all of your body systems. It carries nutrients to your cells. It maintains body uh, blood pressure. It helps to protect and cushion your joints and organs. It controls your body temperature. It helps with your digestion and absorption of nutrients. It gets rid of waste in your urine and feces, and it helps uh, keep your bowels regular. So that's just a few of the functions that fluid and water um, do in the body. There's so many more. Uh, it's really very important to make sure that you're consuming uh, enough water up to 2.2 liters a day if possible. 
All right, so the last category of foods that we're going to talk to is kind of this other foods category. So I'm sure you can guess the types of foods that fall under this category. And I apologize, I know this slide always makes everybody feel really hungry, uh, but hopefully you won't rush out and have any of these foods uh, right away after this presentation. But I will say that uh, right off the bat, there is no bad food, right? So these foods are often thought of as unhealthy or bad, but we want to make sure there's always room for these treats in a, in a balanced diet. So these foods should really be eaten in moderation and enjoyed every now and then because if we all enjoy them. Uh, I certainly do. And it's important to remember that mental health is a really important uh, concept, especially in uh, in these types of times with our social isolation, we want to be keeping our our self motivated and happy and healthy. So by consuming these foods every now and then, I think that that plays a really great role in doing that. So we don't want to forget about that or restrict ourselves. Now is not the time to restrict. Uh, it's it's a time to stay as healthy as we can, both physically and mentally. So if that means including some of these types of other foods or processed foods every now and then, then no problem, It's uh, that's understandable. But it's important to remember that it should be, you know, in moderation and your priority should be those other food categories that we've just discussed. The reason that these foods should not be eaten as often as the other types of foods is that they're typically high in either sodium, sugar, or saturated fat, or sometimes all three. And these can all play a role in increasing your risk for uh, different types of chronic diseases. So that's really the evidence and the reason behind why foods that fall in this category should be limited um, just for your overall uh, long term health. But like I said, in the times of social distancing, especially it's important to eat foods that bring us comfort as well as nutrition. So don't forget that. So lastly, I will touch a little bit on dieting. Um, so when we talk about fad diets, uh, a fad diet is typically a diet that is popular for a short period of time and usually promotes or promises rapid weight loss and other really great health advantages that usually sound too good to be true. It's usually a quick fix. So if you follow this diet for a few weeks, you're going to lose whatever amount of weight they're promoting. And usually it's, it's quite unbelievable. They're often characterized by highly restrictive or unusual food choices, and they can cause serious health problems. So some of the different types of fad diets that fall under this category would include uh, the keto diet, intermittent fasting. Uh, there's a huge variety of different diets that are really quite popular these days. Um, and my advice to you is, is not to follow them, particularly during this time. Uh, now is not the time to decide to follow a new restrictive diet and give it a try. As I said, it's a time uh, to stay happy and healthy. Make sure that you're following a balanced diet and getting all of the energy and nutrients that you need. And unfortunately, when people follow these types of fad diets, they're usually not getting nearly enough energy or nutrients that they need to stay healthy. And that's what we want to avoid in this time. And always, really. So here we have um, a typical energy balance scale. And this is the idea that most diets are really based off. And that's the idea that your food intake and your activity level are, they should be equal or the activity should be higher in order to lose weight. So you should eat less and move more and then that's how you would lose weight. But unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. There's lots of other factors. Um, that play a role in this balance and it's not always this easy so the diets like to make it seem this easy but when we think about genetics and lifestyle and just the fact that we're all humans with jobs and families and pets and lots going on in our lives it's not always so easy to follow a very strict diet as well as a very strict activity uh, regime so just that, to keep that in mind, um, that it's not quite as simple as some of these fad diets make it out to be. Um, and in terms of why they don't work, just a, a quick summary on, uh, on the, the flawed thinking of, of diet industry um, is that they don't reflect your usual habits. So like I said, they, they don't 
fit well in our everyday life with jobs and kids and all of that, um, it's not easy to continue to stick with them. They often uh, encourage you to ignore your natural hunger and fullness cues um, and learn to eat perhaps when you're not hungry or when you're really hungry, um, which is not a good idea because we really want to be able to trust our natural cues and that's a, the that's really the best way to know when you've eaten enough or too much or not enough. They also play a role in slow uh, slowing our metabolism. So if you eat an insufficient number of carbohydrates or calories or whatever it may be, um, your body is going to sort of go into what we call starvation mode and it thinks that you are being deprived, which you are, but it doesn't know that you're doing it on purpose. So it will actually slow down your metabolism, which will allow your body to burn less calories to stay alive in order to try to preserve the energy that it's that it's getting from the foods that you're eating because it's not enough. So that's really the opposite effect of what most people are trying to achieve when they go on a diet. And usually people don't know that this happens. So just something to keep in mind. It's better to eat as much energy as your body requires rather than restricting, and then your metabolism will stay healthy and normal. So really overall, uh, diets typically are, are the ones that fail us um, because they don't teach us how to change our lifestyles for good. Instead, they give us these highly restrictive regimes to follow um, and end up resulting in failure because they're too difficult to stick to in the long term and they're just not achievable. So overall, uh, my advice is to, like I said, to not worry about any of these types of diets and instead just follow uh, the advice of Canada's Food Guide and of me, what I've said to you today, making sure that you're getting a healthy balance of all your macronutrients and micronutrients and including all of those foods in your balanced diet. That's really the best way to achieve a healthy weight and a healthy lifestyle. So the last section here is, uh, like I promised, we're going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and healthy eating. Uh, I've tied it in already a few times, but we'll just really drive the point home here at the end. Hopefully you're not too sick of hearing about the coronavirus. I know there's a lot about it going on right now, uh, but it's obviously the most relevant topic right now. So I did want to touch a little bit on it uh, before we finish off today. So when we think about healthy eating during this time, it's really important to continue to eat on a regular schedule. It's a lot more uh, difficult to do this because you're not getting up at a certain time every day, going to work, having the same lunch hour, and then getting home, cooking dinner, and eating with your family. You don't have that typical schedule, likely, if you're, if you're working from home. So try to still eat your three meals per day and try to still space those meals about three to six hours apart including breakfast every day. I know sometimes it's easy to sleep in and skip breakfast altogether and just go straight to lunch, but it is a really great idea to kickstart your metabolism in the morning by having even something small, like a piece of fruit, a piece of toast or a smoothie for breakfast every day, um, if you can. And then try to include one or two healthy snacks throughout the day. If you're uh, working from an at-home office, perhaps um, take a break and go and uh, make a little snack to bring back uh, to the office with you to munch on while you're getting your work done to make sure that you're not ignoring your hunger cues throughout the day and you're following this, a similar schedule that you would follow if you were working regularly. Another tip is uh, just to aim for the right balance. So follow Canada's food guide whenever possible. And anytime that you're making a meal, try to make sure that you are including uh, lots of vegetables and fruit, grain products, and then your protein foods, which includes uh, dairy products as well as protein, meat, and alternatives. Uh, another relevant topic with this pandemic is comfort food. So I know that when people are stressed, many people tend to reach for certain comfort foods to try to feel better. And typically these foods are um, less healthy choices. And then typically they're consumed in large amounts to try to feel better. And that can over time lead to someone not feeling very well and, and down the line can actually lead to some negative health effects. So although I did mention earlier that we should still be including our fun foods and making sure that we're eating foods that we enjoy, keep in mind that if you're 
always eating uh, those types of foods, um, the other food category as your comfort food, then that can add up and you may not feel so great if you're doing that day in and day out. So here's a list of just a few suggestions of some healthier alternatives to some of those comfort foods that you could perhaps try um, and see how you like in, in place of perhaps a piece of cake or a bag of chips or whatever it is that you find yourself reaching for. Try some of these suggestions instead, like fruit or veggies with a side dish. I really love uh, air popped popcorn or some yogurt with berries. There's lots of different things that you could try um, and just sort of shift your mindset um, to try seeing what types of comfort you can get from these foods as well so that you're not always reaching for the other food category every single day because then we would be not so much eating those foods in moderation if it becomes a daily habit. Okay. So we also want to try to meal plan, especially during this time. So by making a meal plan, you would essentially be deciding what types of foods you want to eat each day of the week. Um, and from that meal plan, you can develop a grocery list and then go shopping. So it's a really great idea, especially during this time, to know ahead of time what you need to buy so that you don't miss something. Because unlike normal times, this is not the time that you want to be running to the store for one or two things that you forgot. This is the time when you want to go, you know, as few times as possible to minimize your exposure to the disease and to other people when we're trying to socially isolate. So by having a plan and knowing what meals you're going to eat ahead of time for the whole week, then you can have a better idea of what you need and organize your list so that you're prepared when you get to the store and you know uh, what it is you need to get. Then that way you can cook these great healthy meals at home. You're not th trying to think of ideas in the last minute. Um, you're, you're feeling prepared. You're eating great food um, during this crazy time because this is a great opportunity to learn new skills and try new foods and try new recipes. So take advantage of it and plan ahead. Um, just a few priority purchases as well. So some of these foods are great suggestions for things to have in your cupboard uh, that last a little bit longer sometimes uh, than other foods so that you can be prepared for up to one to two weeks without going to the grocery store. So uh, you wanna make sure you're including long lasting fruits and vegetables. So for example, root vegetables or potatoes are really great. Um, citrus fruits like oranges and apples are awesome uh, because they have quite a long shelf life as well as lots of um, uh, spices like garlic, ginger, and onions. They help to add flavor. So focus on those types of uh, produce because um, you don't necessarily want to buy things that are going to go bad within a day or two. You want to have things that maybe last a little bit longer during this time. For those types of foods, perhaps you really do love your blueberries or strawberries, then perhaps look at the frozen options um, because these foods are flash frozen and they have all the same nutrients and flavor, like I said earlier, as fresh fruits. So it's a great option if you want to be able to enjoy those types of foods, um, but you're worried about them going bad and you running out, then this is a great option. When we look over to the right at the grains options, so choose whole grains more often than white. Um, ancient grains are a great suggestion and some of them are quick cook. However, I think many of us have lots of time on our hands so we're not too worried about the length of time that things take to cook these days, at least I'm not. So maybe try some that take a little longer and, and give, it a, give it a chance. Uh, as well as your starchy root, uh, root vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes, you can try uh, cooking these a variety of ways because they last a long time in, in the pantry. And lastly, protein foods to focus on. Uh, this would include nuts and seeds as well as nut butters like peanut butter made from 100% peanuts if possible without all the added in ingredients. Uh, things like eggs, they last a long time, and uh, legumes are excellent sources of protein during this time, can canned or dried. Uh, something that's not on here, but I would add, is if you are eating meat, then most meats freeze very well and very easily. So you can buy in bulk and freeze um, and then take it out as needed over time. So that way they last a lot longer rather than just keeping them in the fridge. 
Okay. My last point here is on grocery shopping. So I mentioned the importance of minimizing our time at the grocery store or the amount of times that we go to the grocery store. Um, but in case someone is perhaps not aware of these options, PC Express and Walmart's online shopping feature are really great options if you're interested in shopping online. They allow you to go through the store virtually, uh, pick out all of the exact uh, items that you'd like to purchase and build a shopping cart. And then you get to choose a pickup time where you go, you park in the parking lot, they bring the groceries right out to your car, um, and they'll even charge the credit card that you have on file so you don't have to pay with the machine or anything. It's very smooth and very easy. They've worked really hard to get these systems working well uh, during this time. So if this is something that's available to you in your area, I would recommend giving it a try, either through PC Loblaws or through Walmart. Those are both great options. So just something to keep in mind. If you're a bit wary of going into the grocery store, then it's a great option. All right, so that really brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, this is just the final slide that they've asked me to include for some resources that are available to you as uh, military members or DND civilians. Um, so here's there are just some numbers and links for different uh, information or phone lines if you need any of these resources, they're there. Uh, for this one, feel free to take a picture of it uh, if you want this information. Uh, because I'm going to be moving away from this slide here in a moment. So if you need these numbers or want the website links, then maybe take a picture right now and then uh, you'll have it for the future. Okay. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, wow, we went exactly from 2.02 to 3.02, so it was exactly an hour. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to exit now the presentation mode, and you'll see my face again. And then if you have any questions, you can ask those in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them uh, as I can. So we'll see if I can't get this working. And hopefully you'll be able to see me here in a second. Okay, so let's see if we have any questions. I see there's one here. Would you be able to chat about the differences between whole grain versus whole wheat? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you, Michael. Um, so whole grain and whole wheat, there is a difference. Um, so when we look at the, the, when we think back to the slide that I showed you um, about the uh, whole grain versus white, um, where we saw the differences in, um, in the parts of the grain that are included in that. Um, the whole grain is the better choice. So if you're looking at the ingredient list, um, always make sure to look for something that includes a whole grain rather than something that just says a whole wheat. So when we think back to that diagram, whole wheat, it only includes the endosper endosperm and bran. So although it does include the bran, so remember the bran is um, that little small part in the, in the middle of the grain. It does not include um, the germ, or sorry, no, it, it includes the bran, which is the exterior part. Sorry, my, my bad. The, the bran is the exterior part of the grain that includes the fiber and nutrients, but it does not include uh, the germ. So that's the part that's missing. So the whole grain includes all three whereas the whole wheat is only the endosperm and bran and not the germ. So that's why you want to make sure that you're including the whole grain as much as possible. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, do you consider sausages and ground beef part of processed food? Great question. Um, I'll kind of separate them. I would say more so for sausages and less so for ground beef. Um, sausages involve more processing. Um, and often have more added ingredients, whereas ground beef typically is just the beef, but ground. So it doesn't necessarily have added salt and other ingredients, whereas sausages often will be quite high in sodium. Um, so if you are choosing between the two, then I would say go for your ground beef more often than your sausages. Um, but I mean, they're, they're both still able to be included in, in a balanced diet, as I would never exclude really any type of food, as I mentioned before. So hopefully that answers that question. Let me know if I can clarify it all. Are there any other questions? 
Give everyone a minute. Is intermittent fasting just another fad diet? So yes, technically uh, intermittent fasting does uh, qualify as a fad diet. Um, I could definitely do an entire uh, hours worth of a presentation on intermittent fasting. It's, it's an interesting one, um, but really it comes down to the fact that you're restricting the times that you're eating. So you may not necessarily be restricting what you're eating, but you still are restricting something. Um, so a diet, it would still not fall under that category of being a, a fad diet because you are still being restricted in the way that you eat. Um, so some people will say that there are certain benefits to intermittent fasting. The evidence is not very clear. So as a dietitian, I personally wouldn't recommend this diet to someone. Um, but it is, I know, something that a lot of people are trying and some people have had luck with it. So it really is a personalized thing. Um, so I would have to work with an individual to see how, how it was working, if it's something that you're trying. But overall, I would generally say you're better off to follow a, a balanced diet and not be restricting the times that you're eating, uh, if at all possible. So that's for that one. Anything else? Thank you guys, this is great. Some really good questions here. Hopefully you've learned something today and found this interesting. Was it very clear the whole time you could hear me pretty well? Wonderful. Sounds like everyone enjoyed it, good. Okay, well that's really it from me. So if you wanna log off now, um, you may do so. I'll, I'll stay on the line in case anyone has a question for me that they wanna ask in the next few minutes. Uh, but thank you so much for joining me and hopefully we'll see you again soon before all of this is is done. I'm sure we'll continue to be doing these virtual presentations lots. So have a great day, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon.